a tina kaitau, tina kaitau, tina kaitau katoa, na mihi nui ki a kaitau, a nau mai hare mai ki te zui zui nei. Um, I will open us with a karakia, which I actually have here, and hopefully you can read along if you want, and then I'll hand it back to Mariella. Uh, I te timatanga, ko te kore, ko te pō, nā te pō, ka puta, ko te kune kune, ko te pūpuku, ko te hihiri, ko te māhara, ko te māna, ko ka puta i te whaiau, ki te ao mārama i te hei mauri ora, ki te mihi āhau i te mātua nui i te rangi, nā nā nei, nā mia katoa, papa tua nuku te whaia, te nā koe, rangi nui te papa, te nā koe. Ka mihi ki nā tini mati o te tau o te marama o nānahi o tēnei rā, nō rei rā, moi mai, moi mai, moi rā, mai rā. E te whenua te tūrangi o te iwi nei tēnā koe i ngā tangata whenua, kā ranga mai, kā ranga mai, kā ranga mai, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. So I would just like to welcome you all to a Division 7 Forest Health webinar. I'm Mariella Mazzano. I'm the host for today. I'm a social scientist based at Forest Research, but I'll just introduce myself again in a bit. But first, we're going to have a video, short video on the IUFRO program. Hello, my name is Todd Ramsfield, and I'm the coordinator of IUFRO Division 7 Forest Health. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this webinar series. Before we begin the webinar, I'd like to take a few minutes to introduce IUFRO and to let you know how you can become involved. IUFRO is a global, non-profit, non-governmental, and non-discriminatory scientific organization that has been operating for over 125 years. There are approximately 600 member organizations spread across over 120 countries, and more than 15,000 forest scientists participate within IUFRO. IUFRO is open to all individuals and organizations that conduct research on forests or forest products. One of the primary activities of IUFRO is to promote networking and knowledge exchange in order to provide science-based solutions to global forest challenges. IUFRO is composed of nine divisions that cover research on all aspects of forest science, including silviculture, physiology and genetics, forest operations, forest assessment, forest products, social aspects of forestry, forest health, forest environment, and forest policy and economics. Specific subject areas within divisions are captured within research groups. For example, within Division 7, we have two research groups, forest pathology and forest entomology. Research groups each contain working parties that are focused on more specific subject matter. Another major component of a UFRO structure is task forces. Task forces are temporary and composed of interdisciplinary teams that are focused on specific emerging topics. This slide shows the composition of Division 7. As you can see, there are two research groups, forest pathology and forest entomology. Within these research groups, there are 11 and 14 working parties respectively. The working parties include research on all aspects of forest health. It's often said that working parties are the active heart of a UFRO, as these groups get together regularly for meetings focused on their areas of study. And you can see some photos at the bottom of the screen from pre-COVID working party meetings. Due to the global pandemic, we have had to postpone in-person meetings, but it is very important that networking and communications are maintained. Therefore, we have transitioned to online meetings and webinars. These meetings have lowered the barriers to participation in working party activities and will hopefully open the doors for more researchers. The current webinar series will take place over October, November, and December, with a webinar every other Wednesday beginning on October the 13th. As you can see, the webinars in this series are intended to be of broad interest to all researchers within Division 7. Note that the start time for each webinar will vary to accommodate the arrangers and speakers but they will all be recorded and uploaded to YouTube for future reference. This is the third series of webinars, and two other series have already taken place. The first occurred from September to November 2020, and the second from January to April 2021. The webinars have already been uploaded to YouTube, so you can go there to watch them if you are interested. We are hoping that a reduction in COVID will allow in-person meetings again in the near future, and two of the upcoming events that we want to bring to your attention are the All Division 7 meeting in Lisbon, Portugal in September 2022, 
as well as the Russian Regional Congress later in September of 2022. Further information for these conferences can be found on the UFRA website or the websites of the meetings themselves. Finally, a UFRO is open to everyone involved in forest research. If your institution is a member, you are automatically an IUFRO member. For example, graduate students that are studying at a university that is affiliated with IUFRO are able to participate as full IUFRO members. In my experience, IUFRO is very welcoming and hopefully you will be able to participate. Feel free to reach out to me, my email address is on this slide, or any member of the coordination team. We are easy to find on the UFRO website as well and happy to chat. Thanks and enjoy the webinar. So, welcome again. Um, I'll introduce myself again because I think we've had a few more people um, join. So I'm Mariela Mazzano, a social scientist at Forest Research in the UK, and I'm your host for today. Firstly, before we move on, as, a, as Todd has already introduced, this is a Division 7 Forest webinar series. I'd like to thank Kira and Philippe for their technical services and for helping us out today. So they're on hand, so I feel, I feel very much in safe hands today. Right, so we are webinar four, as was highlighted, and we're going to focus today on collaborative approaches to tree health. Um, I just wanted to briefly introduce our working party. You'll see there's two main sort of groups, pathology and entomology, and they didn't quite know what to do with the social scientists. So we're in the, uh, the entomology group. But we have a working party called Social Dimensions of Forest Health. I'm the um, coordinator of that, but I work closely with my colleagues, Bob and Bob Pate, Tom Holmes from the USDA Forest Service. I'm Karina Keskatalo from Umia University in Sweden and Julie Urquhart in um, community and country, well, Countryside Community Research Institute in the UK. And we've got quite an active group. I'm just going to plug at the bottom of this slide a special issue we have ongoing. It's on our web page and it's Global Forest Health and Climate Change. So if you're interested, please do get in touch or go to the web page. We have four key themes generally. So they're around governance frameworks, stakeholders' values, um, practices and behaviour, economic values and impacts, and risk communication engagement. And if you look on our web page, we've got lots of sort of research questions that go around that, and I've just included some here. But what I want to do, or what we want to do in the next hour, is to focus on the inclusion of perspectives that go beyond the business as usual, of the traditional natural and social science disciplines that dominate forest health studies. And this section is going to include three talks, that provide a strategic perspective, if you like, on the more than the usual. So first, we've got a large scale UK um, treescapes research program that's encouraged interdisciplinary research. But not only that, there's an explicit inclusion of the arts and humanities and, and which will contribute to understanding and promoting the health of our treescapes. Then we have a talk on tree health research as led by indigenous researchers for the benefit of indigenous communities, um, but also includes non-indigenous. So we're talking about living communities, but communities of research, policy and practice. And we're going to look at the role of citizen science networks, those expert eyes on the ground that are essential for wide scale surveillance. But how does it work in practice? How do you create a successful and sustainable citizen science network for tree health? So I would like to extend a very warm welcome to my three um, speakers. They're absolutely fantastic and I'm very lucky. So I'm going to read from here just to make sure I, I get their biographies right. So we've got Alice Goodenough from the UK Countryside Community Research Institute. So Alice is the programme manager of the Future of the UK Treescapes um, research programme. It's a £14.5 million pound research programme. It's very, very new, very recent. And its aim is to improve the environment environmental, socioeconomic and um, cultural understanding of functions and services provided by UK treescapes. And this is going to inform um, decision making on expansion. We've got a massive um, woodland expansion programme for the benefits of the environment and society. And her research interests include human health and wellbeing benefits of spending time in the treescapes, along with interdisciplinary and arts based research approaches to understanding these. And Alice will, will kick us off. But First, I'd like to introduce our two other speakers. So we've got Melanie Mark Shadbolt, again, very lucky. So Melanie is co-founder and CEO of the Te Tiri Whakamakati, a Maori environmental not-for-profit organisation, home of the Maori Biosecurity Network. She's also Deputy Secretary for Maori Rights and Interests, the New Zealand Ministry of Environment, 
and until recently was a co-director of the New Zealand Biological Heritage National Science Challenge. And Melanie is a social scientist who specialises in understanding and applying Mataranga Maori, Maori knowledge, to biosecurity and biodiversity issues. She's an Indigenous environmental advocate with a specific interest in decolonising Indigenous ideologies of conservation and restoration in order to address injustices and harm caused to Indigenous peoples and to our planet. And finally, last but not least, is Peter Crow from Forest Research, my own institute. So during Peter's career at Forest Research, he studied various aspects of physical forest environment, remote sensing, and the management of archaeological sites within forestry. But since 2015, Peter has been project manager observatory, successful multi-partner tree health citizen science project that's just beginning its ninth year. So it's been going for a long time. And part of Peter's talk will focus on how sustainable levels of volunteer engagement are an important aspect of the project and has helped to ensure its continued funding. Um, so we've got the three speakers. Before I let them go on and I and I move off, I can't even read apparently. So um, I'd like to have, we're gonna have a discussion session and we'd like to know a bit more about your experiences. And that's about integrating different disciplinary or cultural perspectives. How have you done that in your research and your research programs to address tree health issues? And can you help identify new ways of doing research? What are your experiences of impl implementing new perspectives around biosecurity? Who should be involved when and how? So these are some of the sort of discussion topics we'd like to explore at the end of these presentations. And we hope that you'll be able to participate. So I'm going to stop sharing and uh, give the floor to the first speaker, Alice Goodenough. Thank you. So yeah, I'm Alice and Mariella introduced me very nicely. <laughs> and I'm gonna be talking about the Future of UK Treescapes programme and um, talking a bit about how the programme is seeking to achieve interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity to try and find solutions for treescape resilience in the UK. So I'm going to talk a bit about the programme and the way the programme is and also the background to the programme's development, which um, is interesting in terms of thinking about collaborative approaches. Um, I'll talk specifically about how we try to achieve interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity within the programme and then a bit about um, one of the projects that the programme has funded to see how that might work in a bit more detail. So um, the Future of UK Treescapes programme is, a, as Mariella said, is a £14.5 million um, research funding programme seeking to improve our environmental, social, economic and cultural understanding of UK treescapes. So a really firm ambition to understand our treescapes in a way that requires interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinary collaboration. And it's being delivered through three funding calls. Call one, which was looking to fund large interdisciplinary research projects. And there were six projects that were successfully funded during that call. Um, call two, which is looking to fund smaller research projects that address gaps identified in the programme portfolio. And that open this week. And then call three, which um, is for knowledge exchange projects, which will be open to successful applicants to call one and call two. And so I'm um, the programme manager, part of the Treescapes ambassador team. And um, the role of the ambassador team, but particularly the Treescapes ambassadors who've been appointed to champion the programme. So that's Professor Clive Potter and Dr. Julia Eckhart. Um, the role is to champion the program as a whole um, through supporting stakeholder engagement with the program and ensuring that knowledge exchange is taking place between researchers and research users and building the capacity um, for treescape focused research. And more specifically, um, the treescape ambassadors and the team are looking to support the projects funded by the program in their delivery of the program aims. So that includes interdisciplinarity, this consistent collaboration with stakeholders and um, recognizing stakeholder needs and ensuring that the research has real world impacts. 
Um, and we also have a role in, in monitoring and reporting on the programme delivery and impact. So I'm going to talk a bit now about the background to the programme to try and explore a bit this um, idea of collaboration for trying to find um, ways of ensuring resilience in our UK treescapes. So the idea for the programme came about via what um, the ideas process of the Natural Environment Research Council. So the Natural Environment Research Council, or NERC, is a government-funded research council and um, in the UK, and it's the largest UK funder of independent environmental science training and innovation. And the NERC ideas process is um, one where ideas can be proposed by researchers and research users and adopted as strategic research priority areas and become the basis of research programmes. So the impetus for the programme and where, um, why people proposed it within the um, ideas process was to some extent, um, to some extent originated in changing perceptions of environmental challenges that we're facing and the responses to these that were emerging, including those emerging from the really fast moving UK policy sector. So for example, the UK government has commitments to plant 1.5 billion trees um, by 2050 of part, as part of its target to achieve net zero. Um, so the programme responds to the need for better evidence to inform these kind of responses and solutions to environmental challenges. Um, but the programme also recognises the increased pressures upon UK treescapes, so particularly um, increasing risk from pests and diseases and um, changes associated with climate change and risks to the services that UK treescapes provide. A bit more about the background to the programme. So <clears throat> the concept for the programme, once it was proposed, was developed and refined by a working group of academics and stakeholders. So, um, and it was then submitted to an improve, um, approved by NERC to be this strategic priority area of research. And the working group represented a range of interests and backgrounds collaborating in developing the programme. So it emerged from a, a really collaborative context. And during the development process, the, the value of creating a multi-funder programme was identified and discussed with other research councils. So it was identified from the start that this programme was seeking to address challenges that required interdisciplinary perspectives. So once NERC had approved the concept, um, the... Uh, it, the team started to look for co-funding and co-design of a larger multi-funder programme building on the core environmental challenges already identified. So the two funders that became involved were the Arts and Humanities Research Council, the HRC, who um, support research and postgraduate study in the arts and humanities, again, another government-funded research council, and the Economic and Social Research Council, the ESRC, who um, provide funding and support for research and training in the social science, social sciences. So um, once the three research councils, the three different funders were on board, um, uh, the programme was shaped with three broad aims. So the first of these, which is around improving understanding of the form, function and values of treescapes in their different environmental, socioeconomic and cultural contexts, you know, it acknowledges intrinsically that there are many different perspectives on the value and services provided by UK treescapes. Um, and so under that theme, uh, projects could explore the way treescapes have been shaped by different management practices, environmental conditions, cultural and social economic drivers and values through time, um, and how these factors are expected to change with new social, economic and cultural and environmental demands placed on treescapes. 
and um, that theme projects could bring together data and measurements at different scales and from diverse sources, from the molecular, landscape and earth observation through to social economic data sets, cultural and historical evidence, aesthetic and ethical values located in UK treescapes. Um, the second theme, which is around um, generating a new evidence base to help inform where treescape expansion as a landscape solution could take place and what expansion could look like. And this theme is about building the evidence base around expansion and seeking to improve understandings of the opportunities, barriers and pathways to treescape expansion, considering biogeochemical, biophysical, policy, social, financial and decision-making processes, as well as um, the trade-offs that we might face um, in choosing one land use over another and, and synergies between different land uses. And then the third theme, um, which is about contributing to analyses of the vulnerability and resilience of the UK treescapes. Um, it looks to identify the drivers of change that pose significant risks to the resilience of both current and future UK treescapes over decades and centuries. So it's really looking to try and outline strategies and measures, low risk pathways, uh, perhaps that could um, try and mitigate um, the impact of some of these risks and enhance the resilience of treescapes. So how does the programme try to ensure that funded projects are interdisciplinary? Um, well, all proposals submitted to the programme have to be interdisciplinary and fit the remit of more than one of the research councils involved. Um, disciplines from outside the remit of the funding research councils can still be included, but the, the, it's still, the proposal must still fit the remit of more than one of the research councils. And the minimum requirements is to fit the remit of at least two of those councils. Um, another approach to trying to ensure that proposals um, submitted to the programme and um, that approved are interdisciplinary was to, is to create an interdisciplinary review process um, for submissions. So for example, where possible during the first call, um, each submission was reviewed by reviewers representing the three funding research councils to ensure all that the all the elements were properly assessed. And the final review panel each included panelists from each of the funding councils. And then beyond that, the role of the ambassadors and the ambassador team is to explore what support for interdisciplinary working projects might need and try to provide that. So we're just at the start of that process. We've just funded these first six projects in August. So we're really trying to explore with them um, what, what kind of approaches might um, help interdisciplinarity take place um, and suggestions have included programme-wide reading groups where we focus on trying to develop shared understandings and perspectives um, to creating um, a program specific glossary of shared terms and language so that we um, we're trying to develop shared but it's not just different disciplines working along perspectives on these problems for UK treescapes. <clears throat> And in terms of transdisciplinarity, where we're seeking to work with organisations outside of academia, um, the ambassadors have established a programme advisory board, the PAB, which consists of stakeholders in UK treescapes and policies towards net zero and nature recovery. And the PAB members feed very strongly into shaping the program development um, and have shaped the second call so that the program continues to reflect stakeholder needs. The first call encouraged the involvement of non-academic project partners, stakeholders within projects, 
And um, the second call, which opens this week with a total of two and a half million pounds of funding available, um, so smaller projects in the first round, um, has really tried to place a strong emphasis on non-academic project partners co-designing projects and their outputs so that they're very strongly relevant to stakeholders in UK treescapes and research users. And one way of trying to ensure that um, some of these stakeholders um, are engaged is um, to develop the way that projects are funded. So in call to community organisations, and that might include an arts-based organisation with a strong interest in treescapes who think that they can um, engage people um, with treescapes, understanding treescapes, finding solutions for treescapes, they can receive funding at 100% of direct costs rather than the usual 80% of full economic costs that research teams can apply for. So trying to recognise the financial challenges that community-based organisations could face in collaborating with academia um, and hopefully helping to ensure transdisciplinarity. So these are the six projects that were successfully funded during Core 1, which represented um, £10.5 million worth of funding towards new interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary research. And there's a little link at the bottom. If you wanted to take a closer look, perhaps we'll be sharing these presentations as well. Um, and I wanted to talk about one project, take a project and talk about it in a bit more detail to try to give an idea about how um, interdisciplinarity might be working within a project and some of the um, exciting perspectives that it might generate. So um, the project I've chosen is MEMBRA. And MEMBRA... Um, is setting out to explore the concept of tree memory. So um, how's it going to do that? Um, they are looking at it to explore whether epigenetic changes within trees as responses to stress are passed down through generations. Alice, it's been 50 minutes. Ah, I'll try and wrap up super quick. And... Um, uh, trees also have marks of past interactions with the environment recorded into their wood as they grow and a uh, member are looking to analyse these to try and visualise responses to the environment over a tree's lifetime. Um, and the scientific techniques they're applying are aimed at creating a better understanding of the resilience of UK treescapes to pressures and in particular which trees are better adapted to stress. And if we look at how the um, arts and humanities and social sciences are involved in that project, they're engaged in trying to um, look at how building understanding of stress memory in trees opens up new pathways to considering treescapes. So perhaps having the capacity to reconceive of issues like environmental ethics and even how trees may or may not be conscious. So um, the involvement of um, arts and humanities and social science in, in this project will look at collating information on how memory has been represented as a characteristic of trees. So an arts and humanities exploration of our human cultural valuation of trees over time. And we'll look at um, how considering and appreciating that the concept of tree memory could foster a kind of new emerging moral understanding of treescapes and how this understanding might change um, human moral valuing of trees. So um, the arts and humanities will be um, involved in trying to determine not only past valuations of treescapes, but how people can reimagine trees and treescapes in the light of new knowledge. Um, so ultimately using an arts and humanities, um, using arts and humanities 
perspectives and approaches can help reimagine cultural valuations and provoke reconsideration of existing approaches. In this case, um, in particular, what member describe as a utilitarian and monetized ecosystem services valuation of treescapes. So thanks so much for listening. I'll wrap it up there. Um, thank you. I'll try and I'll try and stop sl sh slide sharing. <laughs> Thanks, Alice. Um, so, I, you know, we, I asked Alice to be involved and to give a presentation because it's quite unique to have those different perspectives um, involved in such a, a big research programme. Have we got any questions? Any comments? I'm not sure I can, see, I can, I can see screens, but I don't know if I'd see if a hand was up or not. I mean, later on, I would like to ask if you've got experience of this. I suppose I can give a... a a bit. I'm involved, uh, albeit in a small role, in one of them, uh, New Leaf, and it involves um, modellers, geneticists, and um, social scientists and artists. And it's really interesting that you have to have these um, different discussions, I suppose, between the different disciplines. So the geneticist wanted to have a discussion with the artist. So the geneticist is doing all the genetic evaluation of, of resilience treescapes. And the artists are going to create a, a play from social science research um, and the transcripts from that. So a vert vertin play to, to um, represent, if you like, the values, the uncertainty, um, the decision making that goes involved in, in developing treescapes. So um, have, well, uh, Brett's got his, his hand up, but can you, uh, have you experienced anything about how you get those different disciplines talking together, Alice? Have you got any sort of um, programmes to help that or projects to help that? Yeah, so we're, we're right at the start of that. We've just started talking to projects about what kind of solutions might assist them to continue having these conversations and um, um ways of integrating different disciplinary perspectives and and also um, making sure that each uh, perspective is valued equally. Um, I don't think the projects you know know that explicitly yet because they're they're just starting. So um, really what's emerged is time is really important that actually these things really require attention and time. So there has to be, um, a clear strategy to how you nurture interdisciplinarity within the programme. It's not just something that can kind of happen as things tick along. Um, programmes are planning events and workshops um, to make sure that it is identified as something significant and important right the way through. Um, so we're looking at doing that across the programme. How can we um, similarly provide events and um, keep communication channels open because the thing is as well as time these things are also really challenging and by trying to acknowledge that right from the start um, hopefully there can be a kind of open culture of sharing how people have encountered challenge and some of the um, approaches they've taken to overcoming um, issues so yeah fantastic <laughs> I, I took over, Brett, I, I didn't realise it was a hand up. So I'm going to allow you to have a second question, Alice, because I, I took over. Brett, would you like to ask a question? And then we'll yep. move on quickly to Matt. To Great. Thanks. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thanks. That was really interesting. Um, so just uh, actually have two quick questions. The ones maybe a slightly off topic, but just when you talk about treescapes, is that in, uh, you focus mainly on, on trees that are native to the UK, or you also consider iconic species that have maybe been introduced a while ago, but are kind of now still considered as part of the treescape, or, or how would you define that? Um, so that's the one question. Um, and then the other one I was interested, so when you're talking about now looking at the memory that trees may have, um, and then you kind of then touched on, on the consciousness of, of trees. So, so do you equate those two? Um, if something has memory, does that you know, because I've, you know, you know, we're not often hear of the term conscious applied to trees. So I'm just wondering about that connection between if something has memory, does that necessarily mean there's a conscious part of it? So anyway, it's just quite interesting that you use those terms together like that. Okay, so the the first one was about tree species, wasn't it? And native, non-native, and I think, I mean, that's 
an open question that's being considered much more broadly within um, policy and practice in the UK. Um, so I think that's represented in how um, projects apply to us and the kind of explorations they're doing. You know, what are the risks and benefits of um, uh, perhaps um, planting non-native species? And um, there's already research going on that's exploring um, those kind of challenges and whether we can learn anything from um, the history of non-native trees being planted in, in Arboreta and, and, um, and how they are responding to um, risks and threats and um, what the impacts on biodiversity are of using non-native species. So they're all kind of broad questions that are being looked at in research and um, are free to emerge in the projects that apply to us as well. Hopefully that answers some of that question. <laughs> Um, Alice, could I get you to answer Brett's second question in the chat about the tree yeah. scapes? Um, just because we, we best move on. And sorry, Andrea, okay. um, to ask your question in the chat, then, then Alice can um, engage with you through that. And I'll just quickly, and then hopefully have time for discussion at the end. But thanks very, thanks very much, Brett. Um, if I could warmly welcome Mel to upload her presentation and give her talk. Thank you, Alice. Oh, kia ora koutou, namahi nui ki a koutou anō. Um, I will get my screen up and running at the same time as I will try and start talking. And the good thing about me, eh, Mariella, is I can talk extremely fast. Uh, so hopefully I'll save us some time. Don't okay, worry, Mel. Don't worry. Take your time. <laughs> and, and the other thing with me is I tend to just go completely off topic. So I'll have slides and I'll probably mean nothing in the end. But um, hey or not, let's, uh, let's try and get there. Uh, kia ora anō, as I said, ka uh, katangi te titi, ka tangi te kaka, ka tangi hoki ahau, te hei mauri ora, e te papa tōnuki, ki waho tēnā koe, te rangi nui, uh, ki ronga tēnā koe, e nga mana, e nga reo, e nga iwi, o te motu, e nga iwi, e nga hau e whā, nga mihi nui ki a koutou, tēnā koutou, ki nga rangatira, tēnā koutou, nga manuhiri, uh, nga mihi mō te hui hui nei, mō te kaupapa nei, ahakoa, he iti he paunamu, uh, ko tararoa te pai maunga, ko wairarapa moana te awa, ko takitimu te waka, ko papawai te marae, ko kahanunu te tipuna, ko nga te kahanunu ki wairarapa rātou, ko nga te parau, ko te aroa, ko nga te raukawa, ko te ati awa, ko tūwhari toa, o ki iwi me uh, ko ati gun, rātou ko ati uh, Macintosh, engari uh, ko oto tahi tōku kāinga a nai nei, ko Mel Mark Shepold tōku ingoa, a tēnā koutou anō. Um, that was a really long-winded way of introducing me and saying where I'm from, and some of those pictures there also explain where I'm from. Um, I wanted to thank you, Mariella, and Iufro for and the organisers for having me here today, uh, and a shout-out to some of my uh, Kiwi whānau who are online. I can see you there, Ills and Andrea G. So, kia ora. Uh, everyone... Uh, knows, I'll skip past that, uh, everyone here is probably a nature lover. We all feel a connection to her. Uh, she is vital to our physical survival and also mental and spiritual survival. For us in Aotearoa, New Zealand, our relationship to land is one of our unique characteristics. I'm sure this is true for many of you also. All of our ancestors from here in Aotearoa made a conscious effort to travel across oceans to get to these islands at the bottom of the globe. Many came for a better life to access new resources. Others came for a more relaxed lifestyle linked to nature. Uh, so New Zealanders have a passion by and large for outdoors, uh, New Zealanders like activities that make the make uh, the most of our spectacular landscapes, uh, and that is why many tourists come here as well. Uh, but as you will know, our world is in crisis. The relentless pressure we are putting on the environment, on our biodiversity, is unsustainable. We all know that we have been following an unsustainable pattern of economic activity, which has led to a buildup of systemic risks across sectors and major risks to human life and property from things like air pollution, biological hazards and over-dependence on single crops, climate change, to mere, to mere. We know nature has been eroded at rates unprecedented in human history, where one million species are currently threatened with extinction, and we are undermining the entire natural infrastructure in which our modern world and our mental and physical health depends on. And yet, even in that face of extinction, many refuse to acknowledge that the systems and structures we've put in place need to change. 
and that the solutions may be found in those inferior cultures and in systems that have been suppressed. We no longer have the luxury of procrastination. If we continue living in this way, engaging with each other and the planet in the way that we do, then our very survival and our whole area of work is in doubt. So why would we not look for solutions anywhere and everywhere, even in our Indigenous communities and in their knowledges? Humans have been actively observing the environment for thousands of years. Our lunar tallies and the artworks from the Paleolithic age suggest that humans were actively observing and uh, recording celestial phenomena 30,000 years ago in artworks. And we know that through our stories, our myths, our prayers, our legends, our songs, our poems, our dances, that humans have been recording their observations about the environment and in each other for millennia. However, as you will know, one of the issues we have is that while the spoken language goes back tens of thousands of years, written language is only about 2,500 years old. Widespread literacy is perhaps only a couple of hundred years old. So in the five billion year history of our planet, written lit literacy is less than an eye blink. Unfortunately, concurrent with that eye blink has been the acceleration of development in human ingenuity and technology. This development has taken us into this artificial world of our creation where we're addicted to our devices uh, and increasingly separated from nature. Those who were once held in the highest regard in communities as the fountains of knowledge, such as shamans or elders or medicine men, what we call here in Aotearoa New Zealand tohunga, have been replaced by scientists, technicians and entrepreneurs. Science and technology have effectively overridden our connection to the Earth's energy, and we now seek truth in that which is written and recorded and give little or no importance to the narrative uh, that has endured generations. Unfortunately, this belief has taken us away, as I said, from nature's truth, the truth that we found uh, in the streams and the beaches and the lakes and in the forests and the mountains and the skies and in the animals. Uh, these natural elements, which at one time we lived alongside of uh, in great awe and respect, are now desolate as human beings uh, through either disregard, ignorance or greed uh, decimate our whole uh, environmental systems. Um, our financial economies value considerable consumption and growth over the well-being and the health of our natural environment. And our devotion to modern science uh, and its underlying principles and ways of understanding the world has, by its nature, deemed traditional knowledge as a bit of a pseudoscience or hocus-pocus. And I know I'm generalising, but I'm generalising probably for a reason which I'll get to. Uh, like many Indigenous people, Māori have a view of the world that is philosophically different from that of the occupiers of our lands. Uh, our views are largely not central to or even part of the systems in which we live under. Our philosophy, which sees us as all related, uh, the rocks, the trees, rivers, hills, mountains, Tamir, uh, are all entities in their own rights. And they are all intertwined. Our survival and health is interdependent. Balance for us is the key to life. That is counter to typical Western philosophy, which generally sees humans as engaged in this war with each other over resources. And uh, philosophy is based on this individualistic view of the world where nature is feared and everything is hierarchical. This interdependence or connection is expressed through what we call kaitiakitanga, a way of managing the environment. A kaitiakitanga means guardianship, protection, preservation or sheltering. Our humans, animals, birds, fish, gods, ancestors can all be kaitiaki. They are all responsible for ensuring the modi or the life force of our taonga, our treasures, is healthy and strong and that the mana or the authority of the people is protected, that ecosystems remain in balance and that the connection between people, uh, whenua, land, wai, water, te taio, the environment is maintained. This principle of kaitiaki tanga is upheld in our Treaty of Waitangi. Uh, the, I guess some people call that the tenancy agreement for Aotearoa New Zealand. Uh, and it's recognised in modern policy and legislation. However, like many Indigenous peoples across the globe, our rights, uh, despite being cemented in treaty uh, and in legislation, are often being ignored or breached. Māori and Indigenous communities are often denied participation in much of civil society, which includes protecting our lands and our forests and participating in research. Furthermore, our culture is often appropriated, stolen, misrepresented, ignored or diluted in importance. Y262 is a Waitangi tribunal case here, so a claim against the treaty, that tries to address this loss of control over our heritage and our knowledge. And these are just some of the examples that are included in the Y262 claim. Things like misappropriation of our Tāmoko, our tattoos, uh, misappropriation of our language being used on toys like Lego uh, and of our cultural practices like haka um, by ad companies, for example.
Um, why is all this context important? Um, it's important because this loss of control has been common in our research space where Māori knowledge or Indigenous knowledge and practices are often ignored or excluded. More significantly, in areas of huge cultural significance such as forest health, our people, our communities and our knowledge has been and continues to be misappropriated for the benefit of others. And I'm, I mean misappropriated um, because I mean that often our knowledge or our concepts are used to benefit non-Māori uh, who can use them uh, coupled with their Western science practices to seek funding and support for their work while denying Māori participation and or funding for the same work. This is all important because the project that Mariella asked me to talk about, Oranga, also known as Modi Order, was created in an attempt to break the cycle of misappropriation or exclusion and all that stuff that I just talked about. Oranga is a suite of unashamedly kaupapa Māori projects that aims to restore the collective health of our ngahiri, our forests, protecting them from two specific diseases, Cody dieback and myrtle rust two plant diseases that impact trees and plants of huge cultural significance to us. Plants that embody our gods, plants that give our, our medicine plants and plants where I come from that are the burial grounds of our people. So Modi Order or Oranga is an exemplar of a large forest health research project, a $4 million project that utilizes Mataranga Māori or Māori knowledge in particular to find solutions to those two plant pathogens using our knowledge and our experts. Um, and I'm going to give you a real, real high level overview and then leave it to questions and let you um, grill me. So oranga or modi order, uh, oranga means well-being or wellness, modi order, uh, modi is the concept that everything has a life, life force, so the life force as well. Uh, so that wellness is the title of the program of five projects. Uh, the first of which is a focus on rungwa solutions for Cody trees in particular. So focusing on our medicines and our traditional practices uh, and how they attempt to uh, protect the trees from infection and disease. Uh, te reo o te wao nui a tānui, uh, tānei, RA2 there, the language and the domain of tānei is a study about soundscapes. And I'll talk a wee bit about that in a, in a tick. Um, RA3, hapu solutions to myrtle rust is about understanding the needs of hapu, that's sub-tribes or um, communities of um, relationships, so whānau, families, that respond, uh, helping them understand how to respond to myrtle rust and helping them develop solutions uh, for um, protecting plants in their areas in their rohi. Uh, RA4, which I'll talk about in a minute, is about seed sovereignty or seed conservation. And RA5, which Mariella helps us with, is our monitoring and evaluation framework over the whole program, which again, I might also talk about really briefly. Um, I'm not going to play these, but if anyone wants to learn more about these two projects, there are two videos online that are worth looking up. Te Wā o Nui is a short documentary in Te Reo Māori, but it's got subtitles. It's worth watching. That'll tell you a lot about our rongoa solution work with uh, Matua Tuhi Ashby, our kaumātua. And uh, if you look up NRT Kauri Land Summit, which I think you can see there, and you look for Oranga, there is a, a fairly long video there, about 20 minutes, that talks about this project uh, specifically if you want more information and you're really bored is what I'd say probably, and you've got some time to waste. I'm going to try and get past it. Uh, so the first project, the Rungwa Solutions for Cody Order, is about acknowledging that for about 10 years, uh, we've had this, this pathogen in New Zealand, and for about 10 years, it's been really hard for Māori to get funding to uh, look at our own solutions. Uh, in our whakapapa, in our stories of our understandings of the world's creation, we know that the Cody tree and the tohora, or the whale, are brothers. And so our stories tell us that if one is sick, the solution is often found in the other. So looking for rongoa solutions for us means looking at that connection between those two brothers and how it could be broken. So our kaumātua are looking to reconnect those brothers. Um, and if you look at that from, a, I guess, a Western perspective, we know that kauri trees used to be planted right down to the waterfront, to the sea borders, and that as uh, far, uh, deforestation happened, they've been pushed back inland and they're no longer on the shores. We also know that at the same time we're having uh, far more whale strandings as the Cody trees have been pushed back. So we're looking for solutions not only in whether Cody tree need to be closer to the shores again, closer to the water, 
but also whether there is something in the tohora uh, that will help us find a solution for rongoa, uh, a rongoa solution, sorry, for our kauri. And I can say that we've had some success, but I probably um, won't get into that right now. It's probably not useful and will take a really, really long time. Um, what's important about this is that it, these projects are done from a Māori perspective. So they're very much done the way we practice uh, and the way that we live our lives. That means that we're going to marae, we're going to ancestral homes, we're having conversations with communities, often with lots of food, and we're talking to them about their knowledge sets, um, what they know about the bush, what they know is missing in sick forests, and what they think needs to be brought back and where the disease is and isn't and why it might not be in some places. So we're having lots of conversations about observations of the ngahiri or the forest over the last 10 plus years, including the kauri that are in our swamps. We're also working at that nexus between modern science and indigenous knowledge, looking to see if the solutions that our kaumatua and our elders find can be tested in labs. And we've been doing a wee bit of that and lots of communities have been doing that kind of, uh, lots of scientists like Monica Girth and Amanda Black have been doing that kind of work where we take our traditional medicines and we test them in the lab as well, uh, where we want to go past that. Te reo te wao nui atane, I'm going to really quickly go over because actually this is like my baby project even though I'm not leading it. Um, te reo te wao nui is what I call songs of the forest. It is this idea that in our songs, uh, in our karakia, in our prayers and in our motiatia, our chants, uh, we replicate the sounds of the forest. Māori language is actually built off of the sound of birds. Um, our initial language was based on the sounds that our birds made, and we sounded very bird-like. Uh, and so we have this or this view, that if we can understand uh, what a healthy forest used to sound like based on understanding what our songs and our stories tell us, then we can replicate that to try and bring back forest health. So Songs of the Forest or the Reo or Te Wao Nui, the language of Tane, the forest is about understanding the soundscape of our forest when it's healthy, when it's sick, and what we can do to reintroduce songs, karakia, uh, prayers, sorry, and chants back into the forest to see if we can restore health. Um, and that one has got lots and lots of interest, of course, because it's very much intertwined with language. And I know I'm coming up to my time. Uh, the last one that I really wanted to talk about is seed conservation, because that is the one that I lead and it's my baby. Seed conservation for us comes in two, in two uh, kind of in two parts. One is about protecting our knowledge of seed uh, conservation, but also ensuring that our rights under UNDRIP and the Matatua Declaration are upheld. Right now, seed conservation excludes us and seed conservation breaches what we would call the you know, United Nations Declaration of Rights of Indigenous People and IP um, promises to Indigenous communities. So we're doing work around understanding what are the protocols and protections that need to be in place. We're also doing work to understand what do people need at ground level and whether that is training, whether that's access to infrastructure, materials, uh, or whether that's uh, access access to people with the right skill sets. So we're working across the country when we're not in lockdown and we're not in uh, COVID restrictions uh, to understand what our communities need, to roll out training, to roll out resources for them, uh, and to think about what a Māori conservation strategy for New Zealand in 2050 would look like, including uh, whether that means we need to build a Māori seed bank uh, that holds our sacred seeds in a way that we deem acceptable. Uh, so that's kind of the wider program in a really, really short nutshell and the context behind how we got to Oranga. And I'll leave it at that. Kia ora. Thank you. <laughs> Whistle stop tour through it. Thanks ever so much. Are there any questions? We've got time for a, for a quick question. And I'm sure Mel will have lots of time then to, to, to respond to questions in the chat. I can ask a question myself, but I, I don't get started in case there's somebody. I can't see. Would I see a hand? Okay, well, I'll ask, I'll ask a quick question then. How has, um, so what I'm really interested in is how has the Maori community responded to this, you know, is it first time ever there's been an, an Indigenous knowledge or a Maori-led research programme led by Maori researchers? How, 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 what has the response been? There's been lots of, I guess there have been lots of projects that have been Maori-led, but arguably in the environmental space, there wouldn't have been a project that was completely um, Maori built from the ground up. So quite often yeah. we, we have to do what we do as researchers, which is 
you know, put forward a, a, a fairly typical research proposal and then just kind of reshape it later to, to suit our communities. This one has been completely built by our knowledge holders or our, you know, our tohunga. Um, and what it has done is really empowered them to share um, in appropriate ways their knowledge and to really um, dig into the research um, and find solutions for plant diseases in a way that they are... Um, that their knowledge is legitimised and that they feel safe to do that because they are in control of the research project. So effectively, the researchers like, you, um, you know, this Mariella, like Jamie and, and myself are just the kaitono tono, we're just the lackeys that are doing what our elders tell us to do and letting them run the project in the process. Um, they wouldn't say that, but that's, that's effectively what it is. So it really has empowered, I think, our elders um, to lead research in the way that that we that I believe we should have always been doing because we're legitimizing their knowledge and it sounds horrible when I say it like that but that's what we're effectively doing yeah well I think it's well from from my perspective it's been a real privilege just to have a teeny tiny part and I do implore everybody to go and, and watch those videos that Mel recommended they're, they're great and um, please oh. questions in the chat I can see some chat already Mel so I'll let you um you um explore the chat and I will welcome last but not least Peter so Peter would you like to upload to this is a citizen science perspective in the UK thank you very much so um, a little introduction to observatory and uh, the work we do in this project within the UK so it's a multi-partner project um, that was originally set up in <coughs> October so I'm losing my voice already. <clears throat> Originally set up in October 2013, it was uh, a 50% EU life project, funded project. Um, lots of other partners involved, government organisations and charitable trusts. So Observatory was set up really as a sort of proof of concept. You know, could a volunteer network be trained up to help to look for and report and monitor tree pest and diseases. It was uh, really intended with this sort of second point to, to help government officials to eradicate pest and diseases before they become established and, and, get to, uh, and spread. But increasingly, Observatory and our volunteers are helping out as well, supporting further control and management. Now, there have been other citizen science projects in the past within the UK that have been very much focused at the wider public engagement. And often what happens with these types of projects is that there's uh, a large media campaign, publicity campaign to raise awareness, there's a big flurry of activity, and then that drops off quite rapidly. So observatory is quite different. We, we are focusing on a smaller number of, of people, sorry, I should have said this, the sort of base of the, the diagram here represents the sort of number of people involved with the, at these different levels of tree health knowledge. So observatory, we want a smaller number of people, but we're giving them a lot more training. They are there to support tree health professionals. Uh, but another part of the project is largely about raising awareness and, and dissemination of our resources that we produce for the project. And, Again, raising awareness across the wider public. So we've got lots of pests and diseases of concern, of interest within the UK. We don't try and train our volunteers on all of them. We've got a hit, hit list. We've got a, a priority list of 22, um, some of which are in the UK and others that are thought not to be in the UK. So... Those are the ones that we want our volunteers to particularly be on the lookout for, so that if they spot them, then hopefully we can manage them quickly. Um, but where there are others present in the UK at the moment, we don't necessarily know the full distribution, the rates of spread. So our volunteers are helping us to provide information on those. So we have a network of, of volunteers. Uh, we've got a maximum capacity of 200. We, because it's a limited number and we give them a lot of training, we do go through some degree of selection process with them. We interview them. Um, we make sure that they are aware of, of the expectation of what we want from them because we're investing a lot of time, effort and training in them. And we want 
some survey work done in return. And uh, they have access to, to the scientists leading the project. And you know, we want obviously sort of distribution across the UK. Uh, I should, should acknowledge our one volunteer who we still have from the first part of the project in Northern Ireland. We'd like to get some more over there soon. We've got a recruitment campaign coming up in the coming months. So because we're investing a lot in the training and development of the volunteers, you know, we want this sustained engagement. We want volunteers to continue to provide the monitoring and the tree health data going forward. We don't want just a lot of survey data one month and then nothing for the rest of the year. We want that continued by it. We provide a lot of training. As I said, we only give them obviously pest and disease symptom recognition. We talk them through biosecurity to make sure they themselves are not spreading these pests and diseases. Health and safety is obviously important. How to take samples, how to do mapping work and to sort of plan their surveys. And we've provided them with a lot of educational and training resources to help them with these tasks. Um, we give them webinars, there are e-learning modules that we've got on the site. These are all then freely available to the wider public as well. And so when we go to shows and events, you know, we, we help to raise awareness of these. And certainly our field identification guides have been compiled, written by project scientists. Uh, they are highly acclaimed and actually are used by a lot of tree health professionals across the UK and indeed beyond. So I'm not going to spend too long on this, but uh, of the 22 priority pests and diseases monitored by the project, 13 of those pests and diseases are known to be present in the UK, of which 12 have been reported by our volunteers. Um, obviously, there was a, this was the first sort of phase of the, the project, low, low levels starting. I should also point out we're interested in this sort of no pest and disease. We want the healthy tree data as well. These are the priority pests and diseases that our volunteers have been trained on. And these are other pests and diseases, symptoms of concern that the volunteer network report. And just before all of the coronavirus pandemic kicked off, you know, we were getting a nice steady increase in the reports coming in. And we hope to sort of bring those numbers back up. The project has evolved during the, the last eight years. We've added what we call our sentinel trees. These are trees that the volunteers go out and monitor on a regular basis, and they provide us with typically sort of bi-monthly uh, reports on, on the health status. And we've introduced lead volunteers across the different regions uh, to help with that level of engagement and sort of help mentoring new volunteers. And we ask the volunteers themselves, obviously, for feedback, what they think of the project, what sort of activities they like, what they don't like, and you know, there is that element of, of co-design. We annually review our priority pest and disease list to make sure it's also current and topical. If there are particular new ones that are coming in, heading our way, you know, we can add those in and produce new materials and resources. So it's very much about making sure that the the project is current, relevant, and throughout this time has increasingly been embedded within parts of the sort of UK tree health strategies. We provide some sort of targeted surveys as well. I mean, in addition to our, our volunteers just looking and reporting on those priority pests and diseases, you know, they respond well to some of the more targeted surveys. One of our partners is particularly interested in, in oak processionary moth across their land. Uh, so some of our volunteers have been very active in, in sort of spending a, a few weeks focusing on just that sort of work. Uh, we've been doing lace bug studies, so helping out other tree health research scientists, putting out um, sticky traps to, to, to collect insects to look for the occurrence of lace bugs within the UK. And we are keen to help and support other tree health related research projects when we can, because we have to 
manage the network. You know, there are limitations as to what we can do, what we can commit our volunteers to do. But we are keen to support that wider tree health message and, and research. We've just launched a nice new shiny website. Um, this has been designed in a way that it's more user-friendly for certainly for mobile technologies. So um, the page orientation and the layout has, has been altered so that it uh, works much better now on, on phones. We've got individual pages on the various pests and diseases. And so we've got some of our volunteer stories on there as well. And again, sort of showing and recognizing the contributions of some of the volunteers and making them feel that they, they have a sense of ownership of the project. And they've got their own resource library as well, all the project materials. So yeah, they've got their own area on the website. There's a forum, discussion forum that they've got access to. We do a lot of volunteer engagements, lots of different types of, of activities. There's a monthly newsletter that goes out. So obviously all of the, the training webinars that we, we hold, plus face-to-face -face pest and disease training on site. We have introduced, and this has come back partly from the, the sort of the lockdowns and, and the pandemic. One of the things that has come out of this is we have been doing more webinars. We introduced an autumn series of seminars, um, including sort of Q&A sessions on pests and diseases. But it allows us to bring in experts from across the wide partnership, possibly even international speakers as well, to give little short updates, little short presentations on how they are dealing with pests and diseases to help engage our volunteers. And some of our volunteers themselves have also been giving presentations on their survey work. We produce maps of activities and results, show where the volunteers be proactive, and again, just giving them that sort of feedback. Um, I've mentioned the, the discussion forum. We also try and hold mentoring and celebration events. So the mentoring events would be typically hosted by one of the partner organizations. We would get some of the volunteers in that region to come and visit their, their offices to, to the laboratories and sort of have that face-to-face meeting and, and just networking opportunity and they've proved very popular and uh, the last one on that particular list volunteer-led zoom meetings i mean this to me is a testament to the dedication of some of our volunteers they themselves have put these zoom meetings in place to take place every week uh, project staff don't get involved this is purely for the observatory volunteers to have a little weekly catch up to talk about what they've been doing, monitoring, where they've been going, ask each other questions, anything that they can't answer if there are questions they want to put to project staff, they then use the online forum to post those. So um, methods of sustainable engagement, I mean, we are very proactive in managing this network. Um, it's very hands-on. We, we have regular correspondences with the network. There is that co-design element. And as I said, we've created these lead volunteer roles who have to, to mentor others across their network. We provide regular feedback on activities. And uh, we do have the ability to remove inactive volunteers from the network. And this is an important addition that we've introduced in recent years because we've got this limited capacity, is this 200 volunteers, and we have others on a waiting list. You know, when we go to, to shows and um, events, people can sign up and say, I'm really interested in, in getting involved with this project, taking part. So when we have inactive volunteers, we have the ability to manage them off of the project. Um, you know, we contact them first, to, find out there's particular reasons why they've not been involved and they still wish to continue. You know, there's plenty of opportunity for them to continue, but for a whole host of reasons, inevitably some volunteers will, will say that this is no longer for me, I'm no longer to be able to participate. So, yeah, then we, we free up those spaces, then we do a new recruitment campaign, and every year we have pest um, and disease training events. Uh, we, we have those training cycles on an annual basis. And I think that was it. So a fairly quick whistle-stop tour.
tour of observatory hopefully i'm happy to take questions or if anybody wants to discuss things after this meeting you know wants to get in touch and find out more about the project obviously there's a project website i'm happy to take correspondence thanks peter um, if you stop sharing, I might be able then to see if there's any questions. I do want to highlight that, you know, some of some of our major de early detections have come from the observatory network. They're pretty important um, to our monitoring and surveillance system. Are there any questions in relation to volunteer networks? If not, I have one. And um, I'm, it's, a, it's a tricky one, Peter, so I hope you forgive me, but... If you can give me one tip, why does it work? Because it does work. It works really well. These are experienced, dedicated volunteers are making a huge difference that are supported now through government as well. What? Why does it work? What? There's one one reason. Okay, I think it's two. Okay, I'll let two, you. Two, know. I'm afraid. So, so, so one is that selection process and telling the volunteers from the start what we expect from them and then the other is that investment i think they really respect and appreciate the time we spend on them training them um, engaging with them i think they acknowledge that and you know it is a partnership and i think that's that's accepted thank you any questions? Right. So I hope from these three wonderful presentations that we have highlighted, there's a lot more involved in research than you would think. Many more perspectives and experiences that can help develop new solutions. Um, Irene, I know we've run out of time <laughs> and we haven't had the discussion, but I, I, I could sort of in the last few minutes ask if anybody, you know, what I was hoping for is that you would share your experiences um, I'm not sure who our audience is. We've still got 50 plus people um, here in, in, in the room. And I'm just wondering if you could share your experiences about integrating different disciplines, for example, or cultural perspectives, or are there are you experiencing or developing new ways of doing research beyond the usual? Uh, I can jump in in that. But uh, so what uh, Melanie and Peter showed actually can be very much applied, not by me, but could be very much applied to what I work on and working with the monkey fossil tree, the Saracaria from Chile, which is uh, very close actually taxonomically to the cowrie, and it's also uh, sacred to local communities. And it's, a uh, uh, sorry, can you hear me well? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I was fascinated by the fact of uh, including indigenous knowledge in the in the work with, especially I work in plant pathology, but uh, taking the perspective that one of the main things that you need as a plant pathologist is to know that something is diseased, is to know how it looks and like when it's healthy. So when the, there's a diabetic disease that emerged in these trees and all scientists came to look samples, because these trees are so long living, uh, it's very difficult to get from a glimpse of one simple visit to the field of what the forest is supposed to be. You cannot detect very like subtle trends in change or that are going towards a decline, for example. So uh, including, uh, I was really fascinated by the fact of including things like uh, the sound of the forest, the, like a lot of health indicators that you wouldn't usually include in a traditional manner. And also, as you can use those as a, to build a reference ecosystem if you want to actually do a restoration. I, I, I think that applies very much, like very, would apply very well uh, to, to what I do. And from, from Peter's side, uh, like, in this, like citizen, like a lot of, in, and also in a similar way as it happens with the cowdy trees, a lot of these, play, these trees in Chile are in national parks where there's a lot of tourist attractions and a lot of them are associated to very landscape uh, like, uh, very like, uh, like like nice place for picture photographing and it's very like common for tourists to go and I've always thought that uh, maybe not as going as deep as with citizen science and collection of samples but because there's usually a lot of spots like using like uh, 
citizens to capture images for monitoring, like like just image monitoring in the like from like building a sort of a database where you can upload like pictures, you define the spots or in the direction the people just take the pictures and upload them. With all of the uh, artificial intelligence tools that are emerging now, like it should be like there should be a lot of like uh, opportunities there. So uh, I don't actually have a question. I just wanted to. Oh, it's uh, fine. Let know that I, I I feel very much related to the work that you that you've done, and I wish that we could apply some of that back in Chile as well. Thanks so much. Well, I'm hoping, Philippe, that you can keep in touch with Melanie and Peter just um, to share your experiences and what you would like to do, and they could probably offer some advice in some sort. Am I correct in saying that? Sorry to <laughs> attribute that to you. Do you want to, have you got any comments, Mel or Peter? Yep, um, I'll, I'll put some um, something in the chat that's probably easier, but a completely, um, you know, to talk about what you said, that looking at Indigenous knowledge gives you other things to do from a from a hard science perspective. So for us, um, not only is it the sounds of the forest, but it's that what, what we would call companion planting. So our stories and our knowledge tells us what plants cohabitate together or what plants are related via whakapapa or, um, or you know, genealogy. And so looking, our elders can tell what's missing straight away in a sick forest. Uh, and what our microbiologists are doing is taking properties from those plants that are missing to see if, that if there's something in those plants that will help you know, kill the phytophthora. Um, and we've had some success in that. So through the traditional knowledge stories of what plants need to be together, um, we start to get a much faster um, approach to thinking about where solutions might be from a, a microbiology or a plant pathogens perspective. So, um, Peter, uh, yeah. And then Alice has got, a quite, has got her hand up so she can maybe comment. So Peter. I think just in, just in terms of data collection um, and volunteers, there are lots of different ways that that's, that can be done, you know, whether it's apps. Um, you know, our volunteer network is very much focused on, on quality of data rather than quantity. Uh, we want a lot of detailed information that goes through to our diagnosticians at Forest Research to, to identify what the pest and disease are. Um, so I think, yeah, there are lots of different approaches that can be done for that tree health data collection. It's just a case of, you know, what is the best, most appropriate methods for the task in hand for the question. Alice, thank you, Peter. This might be a ramble more than a question, but it's um, interesting the way that um, kind of local environmental knowledge about trees is framed. And in the UK, there's like a really strong split between scientific knowledge and people doing citizen science and maybe not a really strong valuing of local environmental knowledge of trees in the same way and I was I was sort of wondering actually for Peter whether in observatory whether you find that your you know scientific knowledge is being expanded by um kind of citizen perspectives on on trees and um, pests and diseases Ooh, that's a good one <laughs> I mean, obviously they're, they're helping with the, the whole sort of distribution and the, the spread of pests and diseases um so in 2015, um, the oracle chestnut gall wasp um, had been known in one part of Britain, and our volunteers then found it in another area that sort of completely altered the way we were looking at this, you know, then managing this pest because we, it's obviously further afield than we had thought. But in terms of, of other sort of scientific aspects, I would say that some of our volunteers are very knowledgeable, and I think they do challenge us when we meet them face to face and we're doing training events, you know, they will ask the scientists some fairly demanding questions. You know, they, they will say about things that they've noticed, observations they've made. Um, so I, th I think it's, it's, it's a good dialogue. I don't know if that's answered your question. But. Thank you. Okay. I'm really pushing my luck. Just one more, if you don't mind, um, Fabi team. <laughs> And then uh, I'll ask Mel to close the meeting. But Jeff Williams, I don't know if you want to ask your question or whether you want me to read it out. I don't mind if you're shy, but um, if you're able oh, to. Yeah, I'm just wondering. It's so fascinating to this this unique combination of of the three uh, the speakers of the three the ideas of the three speakers that are speaking today: indigenous knowledge, citizen science, and even just connecting 
science ideas with other kind of um, systems of knowledge that are outside of science. And it really makes me think, I mean, that's not easy, right? I mean, what, what you all working towards and what you've accomplished, it's, it's it, uh, at least coming from the perspective of, I don't know, an, an academic, I guess, um, it, it seems to be the ultimate challenge that we're faced with. And um, I'm just wondering, like, what's the, <laughs> what's the secret to making it work? Because I, I feel like there's got to be challenges along the way. And uh, I think we all could learn from you and h- how to navigate those. Oh, difficult. Mel, can I put you on the spot? Uh, just... Thanks, Mary. Alice is the <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> There may oh, not good. be an answer to this in that can be done in, in one and a half minutes. But I <laughs> no, I guess from, from our perspective, and this won't surprise any of you, I mean, you all will be highly intelligent people, but you know, from an Indigenous perspective, research and science has, has been a weapon against Indigenous communities. So there's this, there's one, there's a fear of um, participating uh, and a suspicion about being included, but also there's this feeling of being disempowered, that your knowledge, your practices, uh, you know, your ways of working and understanding the world are not empowered or included uh, in ways that are meaningful, safe, or safe. And so for us, the biggest, um, you know, the biggest learning has been about us as researchers and academics, even Indigenous researchers and academics taking a back back seat and letting communities, elders, um, rangatahi students, you know, young people lead uh, and guide the research in ways that empower them and let them. So, you know, your question was that how do we empower them or, you know, just letting them lead and be empowered uh, from our perspective is, is the starting place. So it's a wee bit about demystifying science and the science process. So quite a lot about science, edu- you know, education um, and demystifying the process of doing research. But equally, it's about us, um, you know, from an Indigenous perspective, us decolonizing ourselves uh, and practicing um, research in a way that is more conducive to the way communities behave. So uh, for me, it's about um, disempowering us as researchers and academics a wee bit and empowering our communities and those that we want to we want to work with and that we want, you know, um, to be included. It's a really bad answer, Mariella. No, it's a wonderful answer. And I'm sorry, Peter and Alice, we have to close. We're 10 minutes run over. So um, thank you ever so much to everybody that stayed with us. Um, and I can I ask Melanie to close us out? Oh, kia ora, Mariella um, and Fano for joining us to today, tonight, whatever the time is for you. It's um, half past 10 at night for me and many others. Um, ngā mihi mō tō whakaaro, mō tō kōrero, mō tō uh, kaupapa for your words, your thoughts um, uh, that you've shared today. So I will close us with a karakia. Um, kia tau, kia tātou katoa, tia tawhai o tātou a riki o hikuraiti me te aroha o te atu me te whiwhi nā tahi tanga ki te wairu a tāpū āki āki āki. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.